Okay, so for uh, day two, we definitely want to review day one, okay? So you can just use your graph paper when we hit a new curve, but I was just going to review the old ones. So here are some of the ones we've studied. Uh, the simplest graphs are like R equals 3. R equals 3 is literally a circle with radius 3 centered at the pole. Yeah. So this is a uh, circle, obviously, and it's centered at the pole, centered at the pole, and the radius is, what's the radius? Three. Very trivial problem, right? But you can actually prove that R equals three is a circle of radius three by converting it into Cartesian coordinate. It's not worth our time, okay? So that's like a lame, trivial example there. Okay, let's go on to our next example. Uh, the next example is when you have like theta equals a number, like pi over 6. So what it means is you're supposed to sketch along the pi over 6 ray, and it doesn't say what r is. So I guess you're just going to have to put every possible r on here, including the halfers and the negatives, you see. So what ends up happening is you get the line uh, with passing through the uh, pole. So this is a, basically a line with slope. And to get the slope, you'd actually need to do a tangent. Because this, this represents inverse tan of y over x equals pi over 6. So if you tan both sides, you get y over x equals root 3 over 3. And therefore, y is root 3 over 3x. So your slope is root 3 over 3 <coughs> passing through the pole. OK, so let's just generalize that. Let's say you run, you run into a problem that says just theta <coughs> equals a. It's a line of slope <coughs> tan a passing through the pole. So it's a line with slope tan A passing through the pole. The easiest way by far to do these is to convert them into rectangular, these lines. Okay? All right, next would be for example, what we did for warm-up the other day. Um, R equals 4 over cosine theta. You might remember doing this. Now, if you cross multiply this, you realize, oh my goodness, this is just x equals 4. Maybe you don't see it, though. Maybe you didn't realize that. And you took the time to plot it carefully, you get this. OK? So let's generalize. If it's r equals a over cos theta, right, it's going to represent the line x equals a. So r equals a over cos theta is going to represent x equals a because when you cross multiply it, you literally get r cos theta equals a, or x equals a, see? So if x is a, square the line. So this would be vertical line at x equals a. Think of it that way. Now, let's say that I'm just being really mean one day, and I decide I'm going to trick my students. I'm going to change this to a sign. Okay, so don't shout out if you know what happens here. But just think with me here. What really is the difference between sine and cosine? Think in the Cartesian world. What is the difference between sine and cosine, really? What's the difference? There's not that much difference, right? What's the difference between sine and cosine? So this is y equals cos x. This is y equals sine x. The real difference is a shifting effect, right? That's all it is. It's just a shift, and it's not even that big of a shift. What's the true statement here? You'd have to shift the green graph which way? Left, well, the shorter distance is to shift it to the left how much? Okay, or you say the co 
cosine wave, if you shift it to the right pi over 2, you've got yourself a sine wave. So a right shift pi over 2 turns a cosine into a sine, right? In this world, we don't slide right and left. Rightward sliding represents turning this way. And leftward sliding in this world represents turning this way. See? Positive angles, negative angles. In this graph, it's positive angles, negative angles. <coughs> so if I want to graph r equals a over sine, I would just simply turn this 90 degrees. So the graph for r equals 4 over sine would naturally just have to be here. It's a 90 degree rotation. It corresponds to a right shift 90 in the Cartesian world. If you can see that connection, that's huge. Okay. If you can't yet, that's fine. Just know that r cos theta is x equals a, and r sine theta would represent you know, y equals a. Um, I was going to make this general, so I'm going to ditch the whole 4, and let's just call it a, OK, just to be more general. Now, let's say I was being really, really cruel, and I threw a negative in here. It's probably still a straight line. It's just probably maybe on the other side of the pole or something, right? So don't stress out about it. Not a big deal. Negatives just reflect it somewhere else. Plot a few points. You'll figure it out. Okay, so those are some simple graphs. And then we started talking about this graph. We played around with it quite a bit yesterday. It's the spiral of Archimedes. And we said if r equals theta, we get this graph of a circle that grows, also known as a spiral, right? So if it's r equals 1 theta, then by the time you get to pi, it's got a radius pi, and it looks like this. It reaches the 3.14 circle, and this is literally the point pi pi, like pizza pizza, okay? So that's the point pi pi. It's exactly halfway around, and it is 3.14 circles out. Okay, everybody with me on that? Okay, and then we played around with it a little bit. We said, what would happen if you put a half in front? You know, what happens if you go like r equals half theta? What do you think would happen to it? Hmm, I thought you guys knew that. The radius has been diminished to be half of what your angles are. So, for example, it would no longer contain the point pi pi. It would, when you get out here to pi, it'd be at pi over 2. So you got less radius on that arch. And uh, uh, basically, the spiral tightens a bit. And then what if you did like r equals 2 theta? This would be a radial growth. So you would have to get out here to 2 pi by the time you did a half turn. So r would be 6.28 when theta is 3.14 radians. All right, so I kind of color-coded it there, but I'll label it in case you use pencil. So this is 1 half theta. This is r equals theta. And this is r equals 2 theta. So we see that radial growth. We even tried playing around with ln theta. Didn't we graph this one yesterday? Oh, I think we did square root in this class. Well, let me just show you real quick what ln theta would be. It's really simple. We know that um, ln, y equals ln x grows, right? Watch this. y equals ln x grows. At first, it's super steep. Everybody say super steep. And I mean super steep, like that slope infinity, OK? And then it starts to flatten out. And before long, ln x is the slowest growing curve we have. It's so ridiculously slow that if you find ln of uh, like 10, you literally get like 2.4. And if you go out to LN, ln of 100, it's only like 6. It's not climbing very much at all. It's super slow growth. Okay? And what that means is that when you first start plotting this thing, it starts out with a fairly small radius. And it grows really fast. And there's some negative behavior, too, something like that. But it grows, and it starts to grow really fast. And then it starts to slow down in its growth. 
And after you've gone around about 20 times, you can barely tell it's growing at all. It is growing, but it is very slowly growing. And that's kind of fun to watch. So I'm going to grab our calculators real quick. And let's graph uh, ln theta. And let's make it do 25 loops. So let's just all get in here and type ln theta. And under window, let's make our theta max literally tw uh, 50 pi. That's 25 full turns. And you can watch it go. You might need to do a zoom standard and a zoom square. So press zoom standard and then abort it. And press zoom square so it looks nice and round. So we're going to watch it do 25 full loops. Maybe I didn't save my window there. It went back to 2 pi when I did the zoom standard. Uh, let's now change it to 50 pi. So 25 loops, here we go. It's growing, it's growing. And then it decides it doesn't want to grow very quickly. And you can wait for a very long time. And to fill the screen, you would need LN to come out to be about, to be about 10. But you can have this big number. And you know, this graph, this is not going to happen. It eventually reaches infinity, though. Doesn't it does, but it's super slow. The same way this graph climbs all the way up to infinity, but it takes its sweet time. And the more you check in on it to see how its progress is going, the slower it's growing. <coughs> it's going slower than before. It's really frustrating. Keep in mind, and for your calculus, that LN grows slowly. So we just watched 25 loops, and we never even made it past R equals 5. Is it your, like, the screen pixelation that makes it look like there's, like... Yeah, there's some display errors in there. Oh. It shouldn't really look like a tire on a car. Like, it shouldn't have these little radial uh, okay. gaps. Okay, there's no holes in it. But it's just junky calculator technology. Okay, yeah, okay, so I hope you learned something there that the growth can be affected by the function. So now let's go to another one. Another one we can graph is, and I think we did this yesterday, r equals sine theta, or did we do cosine? I can't remember. We did sine? OK, so yesterday, one of the conclusions you could have drawn, if you'd gone home and thought about it, is that if you ever see r equals a sine theta, it's a circle. And it's a circle that has diameter A, actually. So I'm going to draw this. This is A. So it's a circle with diameter A, not radius A. And it isn't centered at the pole. You could say it's touching the pole, or passing the pole, or resting on the pole. Okay. So I'm going to put it's uh, touching the pole so that you don't think it's centered at the pole. And this one's well worth memorizing because you're going to see it a bajillion times. Where do you suppose the cosine version is? <coughs> sine wave would have to be left shifted to produce a cos wave. So it would be here. All right, so I'll title these. This is r equals a sine theta. I can't write. This is what, uh, what r equals a sine theta, and this is r equals a cos theta, like that. Okay. Pretty neat. Uh, so, what does a represent? Not the radius, but the diameter. So obviously, the bigger the A, the bigger the circle. Let me ask you this. If I were to throw a negative in here, right? let's say it was a sign, and I just put a negative outside, just to be mean, what happens? Different quadrant? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a very good way to say it. It's going to be in a new place, but it's not going to be a new shape. right? In fact, if, it, if we're using sine, isn't negative a sine theta the same thing as a times sine negative theta? It's an odd function. So you could take that negative and put it all the way inside like that, 
and just think of it as graphed backwards. So it's just going to plot backwards. It's probably just down here. You see? And your first guess on these things is usually correct, but you can easily verify by plotting one or two points, or if you're really desperate, cheat and look at the calculator screen. Okay? Okay. So don't stress out about negatives. Um, let's talk about a brand new shape altogether, and that is the rows. The rows. Okay? So these are kind of fun. If I do r equals a cos theta, we already said it looks something like this. Okay? But don't draw that. We already drew it. What would happen if I went in here and I just kind of messed around with the theta? And let's put in, let's say, uh, 2 theta. Or let's actually start with, let's start with 3 theta. I think you'll learn more that way. Let's put a 3 theta there. And then we'll graph a 5 theta. And then we'll graph a 7 theta. We'll just do this on the calculator to play around with it. And uh, pick any A you want. The bigger your A, the bigger the shape will be. So <coughs> maybe 5. Pick A equals 5 or something. I'm going to use A equals 4. I like 4 stuff. So let's just play around with it see what happens. We're going to try 4 cos 3 theta and graph away. I see what looks like a flower. It's a rose, technically, which is also a flower. And it's graphing 25 loops, because I still haven't set it for 50 pi. Let me change this back to 2 pi. There you go. And I'm going to zoom in one time. Yeah, never mind. Doesn't look as cool. Okay, so it looks like having a three theta here produces three petals on my rows. Mm -hmm. Let's try five theta. Uh, conjecture, please. Five petals. Five petals. Thank you. Let's see if he's right. <coughs> Very cool. Starfish. Very cool. Oh, notice these are cosines, which are even functions. See the polar axis symmetry? It looks like sort of an x-axis symmetry there. Mm -hmm. That's because these are even functions. Uh, 7 theta, let's give it a try. 7 petals probably, right? Graph away. Very cool, 7 petals. What's that? Good. Yeah. Um, I made my A7 so you can see it better. So, what is the A, guys? It's kind of like a diagonal. Like di well, it's more like a radius. It's the radius of every pole to the pole. Yeah, so um, if you look really closely, like if you click on trace, You'll see that your cursor is blinking right here at 7, 0. Let me detach the screen so you can see the bigger version. If you press trace, you'll see your little cursor is blinking right there. And it says 7, 0. See? So the right hand side of this pedal is at 7. And my A is 7. I chose 7 cos 7 theta. So that 7 tells me the pedals, number of pedals. And that 7 told me how long each one is. So they're all radius 7. So the flower has a radius 7, and there are 7 petals. And if I go in here and change this to 5 theta, I said I was going to get 5 petals. But look, the radius is still 7. So I'll press trace to show you. We don't trace, use trace often, but here it shows us that x is 7 and y is 0. So it's blinking right there on that petal. The length of the petal is given by a. The number of petals is given by that number next to the theta. So that's a pretty simple conclusion. Okay, now we've got to be real careful when we make conjectures in mathematics. So far, it would appear that if there's an n here, this is the length of a petal, or you could say the radius of the rows. And this appears to be the number of petals. 
Did anyone try using an even number though? Something very interesting happens. So this is the number of petals if n is odd. Let's see what happens if I use like a two theta or a four theta. Let's see. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to keep that seven. That's the size of the petal. I'm going to get in here and do a two theta. I'm expecting two petals, right? But watch. Four petals. Interesting. Four petals. <coughs> and if I make it a four theta, you might expect four petals, but we actually get eight petals. So you gotta be real careful in math to, to not use inductive reasoning too much, right? You don't want to look at something and say, oh well it works for one, three, and five, and I got one pedal, three pedals, five pedals. Seven I predicted it'd be seven pedals. Or seven pedals. Yes, but did you try even numbers? No, you didn't. Turns out the rule's different. You get double the pedals when you use an even number there. You understand? It's very important. Don't use inductive reasoning if you can help it. There's a time for inductive reasoning. We'll talk about it in section 11.4. Okay? So it's technically half the number of pedals if n is odd, or is, if n is even. So if you see a 4 there, there are actually 8 pedals. If you see a 10 there, there's 20 pedals. That's the lesson learned. But the rose is a pretty cool shape, isn't it? Um, what would happen if I changed it to a sign? What happens if you change cosine to sine? It's going to turn it. Now listen, it's not going to turn it 90 degrees. That's when there's a theta here. It's going to turn it 90 over n. For example, let's say that you have this graph. You can kind of play around with this on your calculator and learn the same thing. So let's just do it on the calculator. Let's say that you have 7 cos 4 theta, and then you have 7 sine 4 theta. Like, what is the real difference? Is it really a 90 degree turn? Okay, that's too hard to see. Let's take down the number of petals. Let's just do um, a 2 there. That way it only has 4 petals. And let's make R2 thicker than R1 so you can see what change occurs. So here's the 4 petal rows, and here is... What's that? Oh, I changed the wrong thing. I meant to change this to a 2. I was going to just make a, sine, a cosine and a sine version of the same thing. So there's your 4 petaled cosine, and there's your 4 petaled sine version, the darker one. So why didn't it rotate the full 90 degrees? Because you've got a 2 here, so it's actually going to rotate uh, 45 degrees. Okay. So you don't need to know every little detail, but uh, I did say earlier that if you change a cosine to a sine, it twists it 90 degrees. That's for a cos theta changing to a sine theta. A cos n theta changing to a sine n theta rotates it clockwise, theta over, or 90 over n degrees. So you just got to be careful with that. Not to take your logic too far. But I don't want to stress out about sine, right? It's still a rose. It's just turned a little. <coughs> and we're going to test the symmetry on Monday anyway. And if there's a negative, we're not going to stress about that. Like, like if you flip backwards or something. Okay, so we have the rows, the spiral, and we have the circle and the lines. And now let's talk about the Limasan family. Limasan family, okay? Okay, so this one we can also learn from our calculator about it. Um, let's say that we go back to that worksheet problem number 13 where I gave you 1 plus cosine theta. The shape looked like this, if you remember. And it looks kind of like a lima bean, so it's in the limaçon family. It's a French word, and I don't speak French, so I'm not sure exactly what it means. And our French speakers are gone today because of the wedding. I'm sure it's a very common word. I don't know. I think lima bean, because it looks like a bean. Um, now, this particular limousine is called a cardioid because it looks kind of like a heart. It's got a little cusp right there. 
Okay, and that cusp hits the pole perfectly. Okay, so you could just put uh, cusp at the pole. The cusp is right on the pole. Now let's play around with the numbers. Let's say that this is an A instead of a 1. What do you think just changed? What do you think just changed? A is going to affect what about the shape? Is it going to change the shape? No. No, A is a number, let's say. 5. What's going to happen? No shift. The size is going to grow. So you could get this on the calculator. Let's just try um, graphing 1 plus cos. And then we'll do 2 plus 2 cos. Okay? So let's see here. We're going to do 1 plus cosine theta. Let's delete R2 here. We don't need this. And you can see the little guy there. He's really small. And then we can go in and change it to 2 plus 2 cos. 2 plus 2 cos. This little bigger. Right? And then you can do 5 plus 5 cos. Oops. 5 plus 5 cos. shape, they all have their cusp right there at the pole, they're just bigger. A makes it bigger. And if you put in a negative, it's probably backwards, no big deal. If you put in a sign, it's just rotated, no big deal. Still a cardioid, still in the Lemason family. So where these get kind of interesting is when you have, watch this, different numbers here and here. Okay? So I'll record this during sixth period today. I'll show you what happens when those are two different numbers. Make sure you watch it on the weekend, okay? Let me pause my recording. I'm just going to pick it up at 1.45 today and record another 10 minutes of lecture. Okay, so the next question would just be what happens if we change the two numbers, A and A. So our conclusion on that um, is we're going to get a graph like this. And actually, this point out here is technically a distance to A from the pole. And the reason is, <coughs> excuse me, cosine can yield any number between negative 1 and 1, right? So let's say that it maxed out when A is 1. You would get A plus A, and that's 2A. On the other hand, if cosine gives us negative 1 as an output, we get A minus A, and that's 0. So this graph basically has a minimum distance from the pole, 0, and a maximum distance from the pole, 2a. Okay, don't worry too much about the details. You can also memorize this graph. It's in the Limousin family, and it's a cardioid. Cardioid meaning it looks kind of like a heart. Um, although this point here is not sharp. It's rounded. We think of a heart as sharp in two spots, cusp here, cusp here. Um, in math, a cardioid is more like a peach, one cusp at the top, or one, one cusp on the left, but not one cusp on the other side. All right, let's go and talk about the next possible situation. What happens if we do r equals 2 plus 3 cosine theta? So before we graph it on the calculator, let's remember that this can give us anything between negative 1 and 1. Uh, sorry for the distraction there. So what we're saying is that as a whole, everything's going to come out between negative 1 and 5 because if we have the lowest case scenario where cosine gives us negative 1, this spits out minus 1, like that. But if we have a largest possible case scenario where cosine gives us 1, this pops out as 5, see? So r is going to be between negative 1 and 5. So it's not going to be that big. And negative 1 means backwards, right? So we're expecting this to be sort of like the previous problem, but maybe it has some backwards portions. So let's see what that might look like. OK, so at this point, we can go ahead and cheat and look at the graphing calculator. 
And uh, let's see here. We're going to go in here, delete some of these. I just want to do 2 plus 3 cosine theta, like that, and graph it. A little hard to see, but if you zoom in, you'll at least get to see the interesting behavior at the pole. So you can see it's got sort of a weird uh, loop de doo right there. So here's the overall graph. It looks very much like a cardioid, but it doesn't have a cusp. It has what's called an inner loop. Inner loop. Okay, so you could think of it as a limason still, but it's got an inner loop. So this is called a limason with an inner loop. Inner loop. Okay, so it looks kind of like this. The size of the loop, the inner loop, and the size of the overall thing depend on the values of the numbers. Okay, now these numbers don't have to be 2 and 3, of course. Um, they're just any A and B, so let's generalize this. The idea is if B is bigger than A is, then we have these inner loops. So it's kind of fun to play around with the numbers. You could try doing 2 plus 3 cos theta. You could try 2 plus 4 cos theta, 2 plus 5 cos theta, and so on. And this will help you basically understand how A and B uh, take their role in shaping the graph. So let's try it real quick. So um, just for fun, let's clear this off. And let's go back to our zoom standard here. And uh, I like zoom square also. So nice and round. Um, that's 2 plus 3 cos theta. Let's try 2 plus 4 cos theta and see what that does. It's bigger and has a bigger loop. And let's try, let's exaggerate, let's do 2 plus 8 cos theta. Uh, everything's bigger. Bigger loop, bigger inner loop. Let's turn off everything except that last one I drew. Big graph, big inner loop. Okay, so those that have an inner loop are those where B is bigger than A. Um, again, if there's negatives involved, it might be backwards. If it's cosine, or excuse me, if it's a sine instead of cosine, it could be rotated, right? No big deal. All right, now let's play around with problems where the B is smaller than the A. All right, so let's go back to the drawing board here. <coughs> okay, so let's say you have R equals, and then we have three... Uh, let's actually start with, let's do 5 plus 2 cosine theta. Actually, let's start with, um, let's do, sorry, I want to pick some educational examples here. Okay, can you tell I'm recording at lunch? All right, so why don't we do a 4 cos theta, and we'll start with, Okay, that's a good, this will be a great example. Sorry about the uh, change of mind there. So let's take a look. Um, we'll just learn straight off the screen here. So going in and typing 5 plus 4 cos theta, we can see our limason. It's interesting. It looks like it's lost the inner loop. Look, in fact, you'll notice also that the point here, the cusp is not on the pole anymore. So our cusp is not on the pole, and here's the reason for that. We know that cosine can only give us numbers between negative 1 and 1. Right? So R here, at the smallest possible value, is four, uh, uh, 5 plus 4 times negative 1, and the largest possible R, so that's like the minimum value of R, and the maximum value of r would be 5 plus 4 times positive 1, you see. So the smallest r could ever be is 1, and the largest r could ever be is 9. That's why when we look at this graph, we see it never actually hits the pole, because r cannot be 0. It's between 1 and 9, you see. And it has to be r equals 0 to hit the pole. So 
already we see the limousons changed a little, and it does have that dimple look, but it isn't actually touching the pole. Okay, so this is called a limouson with a dimple, and it's no longer called a cardio wing. So limousons with a dimple. All right. Or you can just call it a limouson without an inner loop, no inner loop. And I think that's how our book decides to write it. So no inner loop. OK. So I'll draw a general picture of it. Limousan look. Still has that little dimple, but not quite at the pole. All right, let's keep going and let's exaggerate because something interesting starts to happen when we change the numbers. Okay. So right now I have 5 plus 4 cos th and let's clear the ink. What happens if I go 6 plus 4 cos? Let's see what happens. Okay, maybe I should have kept both of them up. In fact, I will. So we're going to keep 5 plus 4 cos, and then we'll do 6 plus 4 cos theta. And then we'll wrap them both together. So here is 5 plus 4 cos. Here comes 6 plus 4 cos. It's obviously bigger, right? And let's try 7 plus 4 cos. It's not only growing, but you'll notice that the dimple is starting to vanish. So I don't know if you can see it or not, but let's zoom in a little bit. right over here. There's the first dimple. There's the second dimple. There's the third dimple. It's less indented. Okay, so that's very interesting. All right. Now let's go back and exaggerate it even more. Will the dimple ever eventually vanish? Let's see. If you make this 8 plus 4 cos, as soon as this number becomes twice the size of this number, the dimple vanishes exactly. So we're not going to prove that. It's not really that complicated to prove, I don't think. But um, let's go ahead and graph. Watch what R4 does when I press graph. The dimple is officially gone. Like, it's not indented at all. You can zoom in there and see. Uh, except it's going to go off the screen. Let me set my X min so you can see the dimples. The dimple is now gone, completely gone. OK, so that is the moral of the story. So what happens when you continue to make a problem like R equals A plus B cosine theta, where A is bigger than B? What happens when you continue to make A bigger and bigger? Once A reaches 2B, the dimple vanishes. Okay, so then you might ask, well, what happens if you keep going, right? Well, what happens then is it becomes convex. So it's not a dimple at all. It's the reverse of what a dimple would be. So it's not indented. It's protruding. All right, so let's try that real quick. And uh, I'm out of mode here. What happens if you do like 100 plus 4 cosine theta? Now, of course, everything's going to be between 104 and 96, okay? So you're going to have to definitely zoom way out to see this. More than once. More than twice. Let's just do a window s sizing of our own. We'll, we'll just go negative 100. Let's do negative 110, positive 110, negative 110 for y min, positive 110 for y max. If you graph it, that thing, it's not square yet. You have to zoom square it, but it looks like a circle. It's not actually a circle. It is a little bit flattened on the left side. But it is very, very slightly um, indented. So it looks more circular. Uh, 
Uh, so it's, it's, it's becoming a circle, I guess you could say, as you make that a larger and larger. So it's just a cool conjecture. You don't have to know all these facts. You do need to know the names. Lemison with no inner loop. Going back in our lesson, Lemison with an inner loop. Lemison with uh, a cusp right at the pole. That's called the cardioid case. Uh, the petal roses. So remember, you can have a rose with three petals if n is three, but if n is five, you get ten petals. I'm sorry, if n is uh, four, you get eight petals. So if it's even, you double. And then the other thing we learned was the circles centered or uh, touching the pole and the spirals and the lines. And of course, the, cent the first thing we learned, R equals three, is the circle centered at the pole with radius three. And those are your polar graphs. If you look on page 305 and 306, you'll see a summary of all these things. And along with one other interesting graph, graph called a lemniscuit, um, I think I'll have to put that into my lecture here. So I'll do one more real quick. So if you graph r squared equals a squared cos 2 theta, you get what looks like a propeller. And sometimes you have to let your theta max be 4 pi to see the full deal. Um, okay, so just be aware of that. Uh, and also you have to square root, so when you type this in, because you're square rooting both sides, you have a plus or minus square root of a cos 2 theta when you square root it. So you have to enter this as r1 and r2 to see the full graph. But it looks like a propeller you might say, well, why doesn't it have four petals? There's an even number there. Uh, remember, you're square rooting. So we should not expect four petals here. This is not the same thing. It's not a rose, as you might think. So anyway, it's an, a strange one to me. Um, but the, this is called a lemniscuit. Uh, L-E-M-N-I-S-C. Sorry, I can't spell today. L E M N. I S C A T E, lemniscate, but we pronounce it lemniscate, like a biscuit. And that's what the graph looks like. If it's sine, it's tilted a little differently. If it's got negatives, then it might be backwards, as you know, and, uh, and so forth. Okay, so there it is.